Yesterday, the uh, Nordic Open Data Forum um, held a number of workshops, and now we're going to hear about some of the results from those workshops. Each workshop will have about five minutes to talk about um, their experiences and, and what they produced, and then um, one will come right after uh, the other. And of course, afterwards, you will have an opportunity to catch these people somewhere if you want to talk to them. But it's going to be a kind of rapid succession, hopefully, of interesting results of the workshops today. Sadly, I was not able to be here yesterday, so I'm very excited to hear what happened in the workshops and what came out of them. So um, can we have um, the slides for the first workshop? Oh, sorry, I'm going to click. Okay, we're going to um, to hear from the open mobility data in, in the Nordics workshop, and you have about five minutes. I'll let you do the clicking when you're ready. Actually, don't need that, you can just hear you already, because I only have one slide. Uh, Perry Conway is my name. I'm from Research Institute of Research Institutes of Sweden, RICE. Uh, this workshop actually uh, derived from uh, a first workshop that was uh, uh, commit, uh, uh, completed in uh, something called Inform Norden. Inform Nordics is a collaboration between public transport actors. Uh, where they looked uh, in uh, earlier this year, uh, they looked at the possibility of uh, creating collaboration uh, within public transport actors on open data in the Nordics. Uh, uh, we took uh, the flag after that and said, let's uh, meet again during uh, the internet days and on this uh, track, uh, create a workshop inviting uh, people from the Nordic countries that actually are in the center of open data, uh, people that can actually influence the course taking, being taken uh, in each and uh, every country. Uh, what we did, uh, we started, uh, 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 we were about uh, 12, 15 people in, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, room uh, with people from Finland, uh, Norway, Sweden, and one person from Denmark. Um, uh, no, sadly, no from uh, any from Iceland. But uh, anyhow, a very good uh, uh, group of people, uh, everyone involved uh, heavily in open data and in each respective country actually representing the center of gravity for each and, uh, of these countries. So we, uh, uh, when we st uh, started discussing the workshop we said what is the ambition, what is the goal? Uh, it could be a nice meeting where we actually just shared where we were in different countries on this area, but the ambition was actually uh, what if we could really start a very hands-on practical work after this workshop? So we have this as a, as a goal. Uh, we started off uh, by uh, some of the policy makers from each uh, country uh, giving the, uh, the background why open data in the transport area is important, why the different governments in the different countries uh, invest time and money in this, and uh, that resulted in uh, that little uh, matrix up in the corner that are also the policy drivers. And we found out that there were basically two policy drivers. One is legislation, uh, EU legislation, national legislation, deregulation was one of, of the issues, but uh, most of them actually uh, had uh, customer focus and, uh, and uh, a drive to, to improve services and create business opportunities actually for new, new companies. Uh, uh, from that one, uh, we, we uh, had uh, de developed four different scenarios of how collaboration could be done. One could be sharing of thoughts and experiences, meet twice a year, sharing uh, uh, what we were doing. Uh, Second was actually share, but actually reuse. If you do something good in this country, could we take that idea and actually implement it in another country and actually help each other in, in doing that? Uh, the third uh, sort of scenario we, was transnational replication. Uh, that we said, let's do use the same uh, artifacts in all Nordic countries, but we do that in separate uh, installations, separate organizations. And the fourth one was 
should we even aim for one shared uh, common platform for open data in the transport area in the Nordics? Uh, we discussed the different uh, artifacts in this. We looked, we had a state of the union from each country uh, describing what we have done. Uh, and we actually picked very good artifacts that actually could be replicated from, from each. And we got a, a list of perhaps 20 areas where actually different countries has developed good things that could be reused in another country. Uh, and we mapped that to those different areas and actually uh, to quick forward this, we came to the conclusion that there are a uh, possibility of replicating things between the different countries and there are willingness, uh, both from the policy level and also from those who are uh, uh, working more practically with this. So uh, I, uh, we've circled the area where we think we will end up, uh, start with share and reuse and eventually come up to transnational replication at least. Uh, that giving uh, the possibility for service providers. Uh, we had also here as a part of uh, our workshop, which could be a good representation of those who actually want to use the, the services. Uh, and from a, a service, uh, uh, service deliver perspective, of course, one single outlet of transport data in the Nordics would be very good for, for big actors to deploy new services. But if we can, can come to the level three, that would be a good uh, start of that. So we actually agreed uh, that uh, we should start uh, and try to, uh, after the new year, launch a roadmap project to describe how this process could be done with ambition to have that such a roadmap ready for uh, uh, sometimes after the summer. And especially uh, areas of common licensing rules, uh, common data sets, and also open source software uh, reuse between the Nordic countries. Three areas where we think we actually can do practical uh, reuse and collaboration uh, to reach at least level three in this matrix. So that's our conclusion. Great. So you, you decided to do more yes. together. Excellent. Brilliant. Good to hear. The next one is called usable open data. All right. No. Yes. Um, usable open data. Uh, this workshop was about uh, how to make open data useful. Um, what I did or we did is that we took a chapter from my book. Um, the call, it's called The Art of Data Usability. Uh, and we applied techniques from the book to open data in general. Uh, it was supposed to be some sort of a train the, br uh, train the brain to um, to use these techniques, but it ended up being uh, draining of the brain because the, the participants were really tired in the end. Um, so thank you to all the participants because uh, it was difficult. Um, to make data usable, the, what you are actually doing is you're just trying to prioritize the needs of the users. And to do that, um, you First, begin by prioritizing the users, uh, because there are a lot of them. And we discovered that yesterday, that there are a lot of users of open data. So we prioritize them uh, based on two dimensions. Support, uh, how much support they need, and how uh, the effect open data has on them. So how impacted they are. Uh, and we, these are six groups that we uh, defined as the highest priority ones. Uh, so a few of these are like mega groups of users, um, not related in any way. They just got, they got the same amount of prioritization. Uh, we actually had AI in there, uh, which is interesting based on Anna's uh, uh, presentation. Um, but but and, and the AI is actually scores higher than software developers, um, which is interesting. Um, after prioritizing the users, we prioritized situations that the users might find themselves in. Uh, and we prior prioritized these um, situations or context based on impact and probability. So how much impact this situation will have and then how likely it is that this situation will happen. Uh, and these are the top six um, situations 
uh, situation groups, you could say, um, that the users might find themselves in. So after doing all of this, taking the users, prioritizing them, and prioritizing situations, we identified needs um, or attributes of open data and prioritized that based on the users and the situations. And these are the top four groups. We did a lot, and we, I, yeah, there are many more attributes that we found, but these are the top, top three, uh, uh, top four um, groups. So cost and interoperability uh, and well-described data is the highest scoring priority uh, or the user needs that we need to address. Uh, accuracy, authentic, granularity, uh, relevancy, and, and understandability are the second and most important uh, attributes to focus on for these users in those situations. Um, what I found was interesting is that um, some of these, or uh, a few of these, are actually measured in the different um, different barometers, indices, um, charters, uh, principles that we are looking at for in open data, um, but. Others are not, and the, the thing that strikes me the most is um, we don't actually measure how uh, understandable or describe, well described the data is. And this is something we, we need to think about. Um, and that's one of the key things that I take home from this workshop. Um, then uh, we quickly looked at uh, how we would measure these if we would build some sort of a monitoring solution of open data. Um, and this was just a quick thing we did during the end, so it wasn't detailed. But um, So for example, with cost, we would just build some sort of a monitoring script that would check the price. Uh, we want it to be free of charge, so it's a binary yes or no. Uh, but interoperability, we would for example, uh, measure the amount, uh, the percentage of attributes that are linked to a schema. Uh, well described is percentage of appropriate uh, metadata that has been completed. So this is this is basically the results of the um, workshop. Uh, and thank you again to all of the participants. Thank you very much. Sounds like it was hard work. I was happy to hear that there were some surprises in there for you. It sounds like it must have been a good workshop then. Then we have the Six City Open Data Tactics. Thank you very much. It has been a lovely two days here in Stockholm. And we had a lovely workshop. Nine people in all in two sets and um, very lively discussion. We were the last ones to leave the premises yesterday, so that tells something. Um, to roughly summarize what we were talking about, um, we need more information and training about using open data. We need to organize trainings for general public, for anyone to find out more how to use open data. We need special trainings for the public servants within the cities. We need trainings for coders. We need trainings for business people. And in our group, there were, there were a lot of people who actually have done, done a lot of these things. And we exchanged the good practices concerning this. And we also need guidelines that we can refer to. We need guidelines on open data standardizing and harmonizing among the cities. We also need guidelines for um, building the open APIs. And um, one significant thing was that we actually uh, need guidelines concerning the role of open APIs in public ICT procurement meaning that all the future procurement should include a possibility to build a open API. And in, uh, to summarize in general, we need more social engagement around open data because open data is so essential and good 
in many ways. We have the societal view which, uh, in which open data brings more transparency. We have the external view from the city that open data is getting more people involved in the city and getting the local businesses, for example, involved through the open APIs. So actually, the APIs um, are a social construction in, in addition to being a technical solution. And then there's the internal view. When we open data in the cities, we also do organizational development and we open up things for more, more development to become. So this is basically what we summarized. Thank you. Thanks. It's interesting to hear the, um, the, the role of APIs mentioned in the same sentence as public procurement and APIs as a social construction. Um, I really like that. Many different perspectives on the same thing. So we have Hack for Sweden 2.0. Uh, our evening was about, uh, we didn't uh, had a, a, a workshop because with uh, the amount of people, so we more or less had a discussion and, and uh, talked about each other's experience from the different uh, uh, participants who was among us. And we had people from Sweden and Germany, so we took it even further than the Nordic approach. Uh, we were talking about how to, as the Headline says, make the Hack for Sweden 2.0. And what we mean by that is that Hack for Sweden, as the biggest hackathon in Sweden, um, has been very successful. But after four or five years now, we wanted to do it and start to thinking, what can we do next step? So we had a discussion about that with experience from other, other participants. And we saw that, for one thing, we want to be uh, towards a more challenge-driven uh, organization and have hackathons uh, connected to a different kind of um, problems, so to speak, or challenges that exist in society and be more to connect the open data that exists with the solutions and, and uh, uh, derived from, from problems that are, are uh, um, founded in, uh, for example, in governments or in the municipality or, or otherwise in the society. So the discussion was how to broaden it, but also deepen it uh, uh, to be more including, uh, because a lot of the teams who've been uh, along early years, they say that they want to do things that's more connected to the local area, not only the national level, or they want to help the citizens in their municipality with uh, their challenges and stuff like that. So we realized that we have to broaden our perspective to start also include, for, for example, the municipalities. So that was, was one uh, key takeaway. And also to be um, preparing the, the event, not just working with the event and the weekend we do the hackathon, but also um, preparing, for example, if we want a challenge, uh, we have to be very clear on what the challenge is about. Uh, and to be very concrete about uh, what we want to solve during the weekend. So the Hack for Sweden has to start working with more uh, approach on, on before the hack, but also during the hack, but also after the hackathon. So to, to take the winning uh, contributions or other contributions that actually uh, have had good solutions to see how can we see to that they will be taken care of in the future. So, um, the presentation of what we wanted to do uh, got a big acceptance from the group and, and we got a lot of things to take with us in, in, in how we want to develop uh, the new Hack for Sweden. So um, to finish it, this off, uh, we can say that the next hackathon will be in April next year, 13th of April, and we will be situated here in Stockholm in a place called Norrsken. So watch our website and uh, more information will come. Thank you. Thank you.
it seems like that's a general trend that we uh, we have more and more of a focus on the the close to home kind of problems and more citizen centric uh, problems that really uh, that really raises my hopes for uh, the future hackathons. Now we have the uh, open data ecosystem growth workshop. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, the open data system growth. Uh, I think I've actually changed that because to talk about what we really talked about, uh, to make it a bit more easy to understand, uh, how to get more users of open data. Uh, this is an issue that me and uh, Jonathan and Karin has been discussing, and we also started discussing that with together with uh, Anna and Miska. So that's why there is they have a, like a support team here. So it's like this is what we got focused on, like how to get more people. I mean, now we have a lot of people using open data, uh, which are already encouraged and interested. Uh, but there are also problems, not problems, but they say that you want, a lot of people want more, like a higher level of usage. Uh, so, we have a lot of data, and at least in Sweden we're starting to get more data. Um, so, and, but how about the users, and how can we get more types of users? So, like broadening, uh, getting a more diverse and broad user group. Uh, we had this picture just to talk about, like, who are they? Because uh, it's not that easy when you start to think about it, when you read like, who are they? I mean, are these similar people? Do they have the same needs? Do they have the same interests? And how could we actually approach them and you know, include them in a better way? So you've got everything from artists to municipalities, to researchers, to developers, journalists, kids, I think we also added trolls here. Um, not that I've ever seen any uh, examples of it, but... So, uh, we talked a lot about both the differences and uh, the similarities between these kind of users. And we talked about the user capabilities, their interests, the preferences, uh, and how would you address those and bring them into, for example, the data portals? So how does that affect the design? And I just have five topics that we started talking about. And uh, for example, well, first I can say that one of the, the backgrounds is uh, that we all have seen, for example, that. Uh, you put users often in silos saying that, for example, developers are service developers. But you can, when you look at it, a lot of other organizations and journalists, they also make services, but they don't get the same cred for it. When you think of service developer, you think of more programmers and developers, for example. Uh, so anyhow, uh, we started talking about, for example, a variety of data formats, like how could you talk about formats? Not saying only that, oh, you just need an API, then you fix everything. Uh, this is also because I have like 60 to 70 students now, and they keep saying, oh, I want a PDF. <laughs> and you know what PDFs are interpreted like in the open data community? So no, you don't like PDFs. But for them, it was like uh, an insight into what the data would be about, because they didn't understand. They couldn't open up the format. So, so, so we, we talked about that different formats give different things. And it can lead to, to more usage in the end. Uh, so 
We related that to the threshold of getting access to the data or understanding the contents. Uh, it also relates to, you know, in the, in the level, in the, <laughs> in the far, the right corner there, level, levels of usage. I say maybe you start out with one format, then you go on and then you uh, expand your usage. Uh, also, we talked about supportive tools that could be integrated into data portals because uh, we started looking at uh, for your request services, but they were on this particular website. So how how does users know that there is a website called Frågastaten, for example? How do they know that? I mean, within the open data community today, it's, it's quite, people know that, but if you would get any other people, they wouldn't have a clue. So then we were talking about, could these services sort of be integrated into the same place and into like the moment in the interaction where you actually want to, when you didn't find what you were searching for, there, you want to request the data, for example. We talked about techniques for enabling crowd examples because we had Wikimedia with us, and yeah, <laughs> and we said that it's a lack of uh, utilization of the crowd's engagement. So that maybe the the examples of usage can come from the crowd rather than from the data owners and the portal owners. And we also talked about how could you enhance collaboration between users, like in a data portal or in the context. So uh, I think in the end, uh, there was a lot of new thoughts and inspiration, not particular for me, I think. So I think it was a really nice discussion. Thanks. Well, I think this clearly shows that it's easy to talk about users as a sweeping statement. And once you start digging in, it, it turns out that it's very, very, very complex, but nevertheless, very, very necessary to talk about the users. The next is uh, my data. That's um, from Ante, we already heard from, applying the open principles to personal data. Yes. Hi, again. You all have heard my uh, preaching about my data. So you are completely bored of that, uh, and it's not going to scale out from Finland, just uh, me doing it. So our workshop was uh, really getting that uh, thinking here in Sweden. Uh, we had six people there. Uh, our methodology was basically me rehearsing for today's presentation, and these six people uh, uh, having, like, what are the questions that come out in your head and what are the uh, arguments for my data and what are the counter arguments the devils had so to say and we had this discussion quite deep much more deeper than of course we can have here in in a couple of minutes so we had two hours of discussion of that and then uh, the frederick who is going to kind of uh, take off uh, this swedish my data hub he uh, semi-volunteered, or I pushed him uh, hard uh, to do PowerPoint uh, slide karaoke on my slides and presenting first time ever my data uh, pitch, like what it is, uh, in order to, so that we have now small group of people in Sweden who are actually willing and uh, hopefully also capable to uh, make this Swedish thing. And uh, this has op already happened once. I uh, had this kind of thing in Estonia, and now they are rushing ahead and soon coming uh, better my data country than Finland. Uh, I don't expect the same from Swedish. You are going to discutera uh, much more, but maybe that comes then more sustainable over the long run. So I think we need this happening in uh, several places, everybody doing it their own way and then having this uh, communication so that uh, there will be some sort of interoperable my data standard in Nordic countries first and then uh, hopefully globally after that. That was our workshop yesterday. Thanks. Cool. So you actually appointed uh, my data pitchers. I, I hope you can do that across the world. Definitely, um, I would like to try to get you in touch with some Danish people as well, so we can also have some pictures in, in Denmark. 
Now we have come to the open weather data. Hi, my name is <coughs> Angela. I have been losing my voice the past few days. Um, it was a good workshop about open weather data, and we were six people and one from Norway, uh, which happens to be the equivalent of where I come from. I'm one of the national weather services, and so I got to meet for the first time the Norwegian equivalent of me. Um, <coughs> we have been releasing open data for, from my service since 2014, um, and the problem that we have is um, how do we get this information available to the right uh, end users? So what we did was we invited a uh, Peter Lindgren from uh, VCARC, which is a company, a startup company in Linköping's municipality. Uh, and his uh, intention with this free app is to be, you can be your own weather forecaster. And what they did is that they made use of their platform, which is actually used in gaming situations and um, managed to have a slick uh, visualization of how the weather systems uh, occur as po opposed to how we normally have it on our website and our, our own apps. So that's a good compliment. Uh, and I think we had a good discussion with him and even Tumas, which is this traffic lab hero, um, that we need to collaborate more with startups who are perhaps good, very good in visualization. Um, because um, they have this end user, user-centered design focus, and what they're interested in, in is not always the science behind all the information that we have, but even what does it mean for the end user um, so that they can uh, kind of understand the information more easily. The other question we have is actually big companies like Google and IBM, Panasonic, they are really interested in weather data. Why do they do so? We don't really have the answer for that, um, but what we said that it would be a good idea to kind of join forces uh, within the Nordic regions. We already have that for like um, model, forecast models uh, collaboration, and we should even do so more in open data initiatives uh, because we have like common problems with uh, visualization, which I just mentioned, documentation, usability issues with how to get reach to researchers and developers. Um, we have storage problems and um, even how the thing with streaming data, how shall we handle that. Um, so what we decide is that we will keep in contact and uh, run some experiments between us um, with, with some ideas so that we can see we can find more collaboration efforts. Um, and uh, we haven't discussed the role of uh, the government agencies in the future. What should we focus on? There's this trend with more impact-based information. What does this information mean for you in a specific situation? Um, so in general, we had quite an intimate discussion about the weather and how we should visualize it. Um, and the question is how shall we collaborate with startups and other government agencies across Nordic? And I think um, it's something which we would like to continue with for, for forth. Yep, that's it, I think. That's really cool. It's my understanding that um, MET Institute's really um, are very good at collaborating already, so it's yeah, cool to hear that now you want to We have it for the model collaboration, but mm. not uh, for that. No, okay. so it's oh, that's uh, really cool. exciting. That's great, great. So I lost count, but let's see if we've got another one. We have, that is also about, kind of about the weather, it's about measuring air quality at home. <coughs> Hello, let's see. So I'm Matthias, uh, and I, I am taking this uh, presentation instead of Hannes, who, who started uh, uh, how to build these small devices. So um, air quality, uh, this was a very practical workshop, but focusing on building, doing hardware uh, that were based on um, the Luftdaten in initiative in, in Germany, and it's now spreading all over the world, hopefully. Uh, in the end, and now we're going to make it stronger in Sweden. Uh, so we had a workshop uh, and we gathered some people and we had a lot of hardware and some of this bought in uh, Sweden and Europe and something from China. And we basically connected the, these uh, parts, the, the actual um, air measuring or the air pollution measuring uh, device, the, the sensor that can uh, measure both uh, uh, two sizes of, of the, the particles of the 2.5 ppm and uh, 
um, and 10, I think. So uh, we then connected that to a small processor unit uh, with a Wi-Fi and uh, made it connect to the Wi-Fi and we could see that it was actually working. We also got some temperature and humidity uh, sensors working. Before the workshop, there were one uh, sensor station uh, in Sweden. And uh, now we are up to around 10 and that we verify that they are working. Um, not all of them are actually, this picture is a little bit doctored because uh, not all of you have that participated in the workshop has gone home and connected the devices at home yet uh, and registered the address where they're going to be. So anyway, there are 10 stations that are working, we know that, and they will soon show up on this map uh, for real. Um, five in the Stockholm area, two in Uppsala, one in Gothenburg, uh, one in Örebro, I think, will show up, and one in Turku in, in Finland. And uh, here you see how they look like, like a sewage pipe. <laughs> it's to protect the, sen the sensors uh, from rain and, and uh, small animals and stuff like that as well. Um, and then the thing that you see sticking out, uh, that's uh, um, to suck in the air, and then it goes through the sensor and it calculates the, the amount of particles in the air. Right. So next steps. We will set up, uh, what we have already set up, the first um, a Swedish entry point to this uh, German initiative, um, luftdata.se. Right now it just provides you with a map. Uh, we, we will see what we can do in the future. Maybe we can connect more, more um, yeah, sensory data from also the Naturvårdsverket um, and other agencies, or maybe from the municipalities. So that's actually, I mean, how can these crowdfund, uh, crowdsourced uh, open data be combined with the governmental data? That's uh, an interesting challenge. So uh, we got some, uh, we, we built 10. I think we have more uh, pieces of hardware left. So I, I guess we will have more uh, workshops to get more uh, sensors out there, and more stations in Sweden and the Nordics. So you can send questions to my colleague, Hannes, at Meta Solutions. And um, oh, I think that's about it. And, and a big thanks to the participants on the workshop. I think we did a good job. And uh, it wasn't that hard, right? No? It was fun. Good. I thought so, too. Great, so you did actual building. Yes. Cool. So, I think it's, uh, we just, no, this, oh yes I did, sorry. Open data journalism and then this very interesting thing called Lenovo. Yes, uh, so my name is Christopher. I think you heard me before here. Uh, so, uh, as, as I said yesterday, uh, I thought that Tarja and, and me would be very lonely uh, sitting in our room yesterday. Uh, on the contrary, we were a full house. Uh, in the four places in our small room, we're, we're full. So, so, we got Anna, from, who's talking here today, and, and Anna from, from Russia, data analytics. I don't know if she's, she's here. Uh, but we had very interesting discussions about our experience from different sources and, and uh, areas. And um, we attached about uh, cats as a web phenomena and if you could make money of it. Uh, and we had data analytics on drowning in Sweden and what death causes you could have uh, on that. But we also talked a little about uh, data journalism and, and the, the, the purpose for, for, for us in this interesting is that I think uh, data journalists and um, the open data movement should should move much more together. I think they are much more uh, so divided, yeah, and that's that's a pity, because as you've seen, Tarje has talked about Insyn. Um, no, uh, and I think it's, it's a fantastic piece of work he has done in uh, open transparency and and actually doing a good tool to other journalists to work with. And, and by doing that, he's doing a more transparent uh, society. 
And one of the really concrete things about this is uh, after we had discussed uh, and talked with Anna and Anna, uh, me and Tarje discussed of how could we take this further in, further in Sweden? How could we actually get the insyn.se and who could arrange and, and organize that? So, uh, and then Tarje's project he is presenting here, so I, I don't need to talk more about that, but I also mentioned a few projects that's really interesting because that I have been working with. Uh, one, for example, was uh, we, we, re we knew there was a really good and interesting database on polluted areas in Sweden and the old indus industrial places. And as journalists, we want to do journalist thing about the polluted areas. By, but by using the Freedom of Information Act and actually getting that data out, you also build a public database on it. And, and the, the, the authorities that we asked for this data was terrified because they thought that all people, when they find out, they go ballistic. And this, we're uh, very scared about all the polluted areas, what, what we think is in Sweden. But on the contrary, it was the opposite. Uh, when we built this public database and made it uh, public, uh, the awareness of these questions arose and they got more funding on the actually authorities to, to do something about this area. And now finally, they have built their own database as a, as a web service, map web service, to actually get all this data. So, so by doing a journalistic work, presenting a database, you could also uh, make uh, data available. And we have made the same things about uh, school data. So uh, hopefully we will, as journalists, maybe push uh, open data forward in, in some ways. Yes, that was about what I had to say about. Very nice to be here. Thank you. That's really interesting to, to hear about journalists getting together and swapping stories about how authorities are terrified about openness. And then there are stories that prove that once you have openness, it turns out to be a good thing. That's really happy. We happened uh, to end on a happy end. That's, that's very good. So. Some closing remarks from Vinoma. Hi, my name is Eric. I come from Vinoma, which is the Swedish Innovation Agency. And some of you know that we have been active in the open data field. And uh, so I was thinking this morning, we heard a little bit about disruptive innovation. And we also seen uh, in some indexes that we are not moving forward. So I was thinking about that and what, wanted to mention a few things and opportunities as well. So we usually say that the data has no value. It is the reuse of data that creates value. And that's easy to say and, and it's harder to work with because we need to sort of think how, how do we do this then. And I was thinking if uh, this is the right time to also do some changes on how we, uh, how we look at open data and what we are doing. Uh, and there might be some other ways of approaching what this, this goal and the goals of transparency and innovation. So we are interested in, in <coughs> perhaps changing our perspective on data and try to see if there are other ways of approaching this. We, we heard a little bit uh, that some organizations are struggling with the digitalization and it's, it's hard to fund uh, projects that deal with openness. So maybe if we started viewing data as part of our uh, infrastructure in society, we would find other values and purposes in working with open data and data in general. There would be also other ways to fund uh, the projects and the work we are doing. So we know that uh, uh, from history, we know that it has been an important thing for our societies to invest in infrastructure like clean water, electricity, roads, and so on. And the same thing probably is true for our digital society, that we could start investing in infrastructure. And, and I think the UK has done some interesting things 
in regards of data as infrastructure. So I want to just say that this is one of the things that we are looking now at Binova and try to see if this is a way forward and uh, how do we do that then. So there are many ways of doing data as infrastructure. I just want to uh, point out that doing these labs, it's a very uh, hot topic now to do innovation labs or data labs. I would say we don't have enough data labs in Sweden and that most organizations don't know how to, to work ef efficiently with data and the digitalization. So I just want to say that this is something that uh, we at Winova are looking at uh, a lot. We want to talk to actors who are interested in perhaps looking at data labs or new ways of working with the data. So this is our message. Come talk to us. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, that really is the, uh, the end of today's program. I think it's been absolutely exciting to hear about the tremendous creativity that, uh, that you guys actually displayed yesterday. And I am so disappointed that I was not able to be there to be part of it. But it was really good to have this recap. And I also thought it was really interesting to hear from, from a lot of, of very different speakers today. It seems that we all agree that data is simply the tool, and now we have sort of upgraded it from just being a tool to perhaps being something that we should regard as public infrastructure that we should work with in, in that sense. And I really hope that, um, that you will do some interesting work on that at Vinova, and that you will let us all know what you find out and how you approach it, because I think we all need to move in that direction. But thank you so much for everything today. It's been really great to, to hear all this and some brilliant questions from the audience as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>